All right, Proverbs chapter 6. Now, what I'm going to be doing, I'm going to be starting another little series on Sunday nights entitled, Six Things the Lord Hates. And I get this from Proverbs chapter 6 here, verse number 16. The Bible reads, These six things doth the Lord hate, yea, seven are an abomination unto him. And the reason why I'm calling it six things the Lord hates is because one of the, the seven things is mentioned twice. So it's really six unique things. Lies, lying. It says a, a proud look, a lying tongue. And then verse 19 says a false witness that speaketh lies. So lying is actually mentioned twice, but we'll go into that more next week. This week, we're going to be dealing with what it says in verse 7 there, a, 17, excuse me, a proud look. So as we get into the series, you know, these are things that God hates. We ought to, to pay attention to this. If this is something that the Bible is, is spelling out for us, God hates these things. Let's make sure that we don't do these things. Pay attention. When God says he hates something, pay attention. We're going to devote the entire sermon on the very first thing he mentions here, a proud look. So this is it. not even just having pride, which is bad enough. We're going to go into the sin of being proud and being prideful. But I like it says here, a proud look. Now, what is a proud look? How does someone look when they're proud? Turn, if you would, to Isaiah chapter 3. We'll get a good example here. But I, when I think of a proud look, I think of someone with their head held high, right? Their nose kind of tipped up in the air. They're real proud. They think they're so good. They're so lofty. And they walk around like they are so special and better than everybody else. That's what it means to have pride, right? Look at Isaiah chapter 3, verse number 16. Isaiah 3, 16. Moreover, the Lord saith, because the daughters of Zion are haughty. Haughty is another word, a synonym for being proud. They're haughty, they're lifted up, and walk with stretched forth necks and wanton eyes. So they're, they're, their head's lifted up. They're lifting their head up higher, you know, and their nose is held up high in the air. Walking and mincing as they go and making a tinkling with their feet. Right? So it, it, they're just, it, you know, I look at this and I could put it in, in today's vernacular, today's the way that people would walk that are proud, they're kind of strutting, right? They're walking and they've, they've got a certain saunter and they're, you know, they're real cool, right? That's a proud look. Someone that's got their head kind of lifted up and they're just walking like they're all that. And you know what I'm talking about. You see people doing it all the time. And it's people that are proud. It's people that care about what they're wearing, having designer clothing and their shoes from their, from their head to their toe, right? Everything's designed or everything is, you know, they're in with the latest fashion. And if it's their pants sagging down, looking like a fag, then that's what they're doing. But they're doing it and they're walking and they're making sure they look real cool. Their hats tilt a little bit to the side, whatever it may be. It's pride. They're walking proud. They're walking like I either, you know, I'm tough or I'm better than you or whatever the case may be. I have all this money and they want to show it off. It's pride and it's wicked as hell and God hates it. Let's keep reading here though. It says, these, these daughters of Zion that are being rebuked here for being haughty and how they walk with their stretched forth necks and wanton eyes. Verse 17 says, Therefore the Lord will smite with a scab the crown of the head of the daughters of Zion and the Lord will discover their secret parts. He's going to bring them down. He's going to make them ashamed. Verse 18, In that day the Lord will take away the bravery of their tinkling ornaments about their feet and their calls and their round tires like the moon. I have no idea what the round tires are. It's some sort of article that they were wearing that was part of their proud look. Verse 19, the chains and the bracelets and the mufflers, the bonnets and the ornaments of the legs and the headbands and the tablets and the earrings, the rings and nose jewels, the changeable suits of apparel and the mantles and the wimples and the crisping pins, the glasses and the fine linen and the hoods and the veils. All of these various accessories that people are wearing to just make it about them, to lift themselves up. And again, 
we may not wear mufflers these days, whatever that is. You know, you may not have a round tire like the moon. But when you understand the concept of what he's talking about here, being proud and having a proud look, you could, you could very quickly identify people who are wearing specific items because they're lifted up and they think they're so cool and they want to show everybody, you know, either how much money they have or how cool they have. And I think this can go further with the, the tattoos, right? And the piercings and people just, they get real proud over this stuff and they want to display, oh, look how cool this tattoo is. And they walk around with that type of an attitude. Or look how tough I am, right? Because I have all these tattoos. Verse 24, And it shall come to pass that instead of sweet smell, there shall be stink. And instead of a girdle, a rent. And instead of well-set hair, baldness. And instead of a stomacher, a girding of sackcloth. And in burning instead of beauty. See, the proud people, they're, they're putting all this stuff on and all this adorning to make themselves look so good. And they're so caught up in their own appearance and how other people look at them and, th and they have their proud attitude. And God says, I'm going to bring you low. You know, you put on all of your perfume and cologne while you're dressed in your proud look. He says, I'm going to make you stink. You have a girdle. I'm going to make a rent. I'm going to rip your clothing. I'm, I'm going to make turn everything that you're using to try to prop yourself up, and I'm going to bring you down. This is the way that God views it. And this is the way that we ought to view pride in ourselves also, that we don't go out trying to get the most flashy items and the most expensive things and putting these on to, to, to lift ourselves up. When I think of a proud look, the first thing that comes to mind is the celebrities. Right, all the famous, you know, the movie stars and actors and actresses and stuff, and they're always going to these events, you know, the red carpet events and everything. And what's the big talk? Well, what are they wearing? What you know, and that's all this huge focus. And it again, it's, maybe it's just part of being a guy, but it's mind-boggling. I think the ladies get more into this than the guys do, but just how much time and energy is spent focusing on what these stupid people, what these wicked people are wearing. And they walk in and they're all proud and they're all cool and they're all special VIP, you know, people that, that they can't talk to a regular person, right? Because they're special. <laughs> they're, you know, and, that, and that's pride. But that's how they are. And it's, and it's wickedness and God hates it. Now, Who knows what the day may bring? I mean, I, I, it's very unlikely that anybody in this room is going to get to some type of celebrity status, right? But in case you ever do, if you ever get popular for some reason, I mean, you're probably doing the wrong thing if you're getting popular with the world because you're going to be hated by the world if you're living, if you're living godly and Christ-like. But let's say maybe you become very popular within Christian circles, Right? And obviously it's not to the level of the world and nor will it, will it ever be in our lifetime for sure. But um, let's say maybe you, you know, people are lifting you up as, as a really good Christian example. Church grows and you are someone who's just standing out. Don't let that get to your head. You need to keep yourself humble. Just like Jesus Christ did. I mean, the, the, the man who's deserving of, of all of the glory and honor made himself a servant and did not lift himself up, although he very easily could have for, for all good reasons because he's perfect. But don't let yourself ever get caught up into this proud look and this proud attitude and walking in like, um, you know, people owe you something or, or they need to look up to you and they'll be lucky if they get a chance to talk to you. Besides the celebrities, I find this also, I mean, it's still part of celebrity, but the hip-hop culture specifically in music, it's, it's all about pride, right? What are they doing? It's all about their, their looks and their clothing and the money, right? They want to flaunt all the money. You watch, I don't know if they still have MTV anymore. I don't think they play videos anymore, but like, I know when I was watching MTV, when they actually had videos, you'd see all the hip-hop videos and all, just flashing all their money and uh, you know, rolling up in their Mercedes Benz or in their limousines, and then, you know, and just all this, yeah, all the all the chains, exactly. That chains was mentioned here in Isaiah chapter three, also. All of that stuff, the rings, the chains, the jewelry, 
just, just the fancy look. It's pride. It's all about pride. And that is wicked as hell. The Bible says in Psalm 101, turn if you go to Proverbs 16. Proverbs 16. I should have just had you stay in Proverbs. But in Psalm 101, verse 5, the Bible reads, Whoso privily slandereth his neighbor, him will I cut off. Him that hath an high look, excuse me, and a proud heart, will not I suffer. So one of the things that the Lord hates, we saw in Proverbs 6, was a, a proud look. Here it's saying in Psalm 101, someone who has a high look, right? It's lifted up. That's what pride is. You're lifted up. Someone has a high lid, a high look, and a proud heart. God doesn't suffer that. God doesn't allow for that. He looks at us. He says, oh, you think you're something really special? He'll bring you down. God will always abase, which means to bring low people who think that they're so special and they're so lifted up and they're, and they're so wonderful. Proverbs 16, look at verse number 5. The Bible reads, Everyone that is proud in heart is an abomination to the Lord. Though hand join in hand, he shall not be unpunished. Now, that word abomination is a very strong word of hatred. That God hates that. It is not used flippantly in the Bible. The word abomination is used to describe sodomites, homosexuals. It's an abomination. It's abominable. It's also used right here if you have a proud heart. If you are lifted up in yourself, God says, that is an abomination to me. God hates that. And that's what we, you know, Proverbs 6. Is, it's something, one of the things that he hates. Look, jump down to verse number 18. Very important verse to remember here. Pride goeth before destruction, and in haughty spirit before a fall. Better it is to be of an humble spirit with the lowly than to divide the spoil with the proud. Pride goeth before destruction. If you want to be destroyed, if you want God to just bring you down, start getting proud. Start getting a prideful attitude. Start having an attitude where you just think that, that you're the best, you're right all the time, and just, just you, 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 you above everybody else. God will make sure that he brings you low. If you want to guarantee some destruction in your life, get proud. And haughty spirit before a fall. He'll make sure that you fall. He'll make sure that you get put in your proper place. There's so many people these days that are so proud and arrogant, especially the you know, people who are atheists or whatever, these people that, that don't believe in God and they mock Christianity. Well, the Bible says that one day every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord of the glory of God the Father. They're not going to be so proud after they spend some time in hell and then at the great white throne judgment when they're resurrected out of hell to be judged according to their works, they're going to they're gonna bow down and they're going to kneel and they're going to beg and they're going to apologize and they're going to say, God, I'm so sorry. When in this life, they're so proud. Oh, ha, 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 they'll scoff. Well, I don't like that God. Anyways, I don't have anything to do with that God. I'd rather, you know, and they, they blow off their mouth and blaspheme our Lord, our loving, merciful, forgiving God. They just blaspheme his name. Why? Because they're proud when really they're fools and they know nothing at all, but they're in their pride, they blaspheme the Lord. There is going to come a time because God will bring everybody low. And see, the unsaved, he might let them continue to be proud until the day that they die because guess what? They're in for a rude awakening immediately the moment they breathe their last breath. They will be brought low. But as a believer, do not let yourself get proud. Sarah, come and sit down right now. Do not let yourself get, get lifted up in pride because God will make sure that he brings you low and puts you in your place. Verse 19 there says, Better it is to be of an humble spirit with the lowly. It's much better to keep yourself humble with the lowly, with people who don't have much than to divide the spoil with the proud. 
You know, a lot of people think that happiness and what you're trying to achieve is just getting extra stuff. So he's dividing the spoil, right? The things that, that they've taken in usually spoils from like a war or from getting it. Um, in Proverbs, it refers to people, you know, stealing and, and getting the spoil. He said, yeah, you may get a lot of stuff with the proud people, with the wicked, proud people. But don't think that you've arrived and that that's where you need to be. He says, much better to just stay humble and just be with the lowly, be with the people who don't have much. It's better not to have the things at all than to start getting financial gain and to be with the proud. You think about the story of Nebuchadnezzar in the Bible. He's a great example of someone who had to be brought down low. The story of Nebuchadnezzar there came a point, he was, he was the king of Babylon. And Babylon became a, 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 the known world at that time as the government for the entire world. And he dominated that whole area, the whole region. And he was the king. And there came a point where he just was so lifted up. And he's walking around and he's saying, wow, look at all this stuff that I accomplished. Look at all this stuff that I did. Thinking that he's so special because he's this great and mighty, powerful king that's ruler over everything. I'm so great ruling over the whole world and giving zero credit at all to the Lord of heaven. He'd already been warned about it, but he just lifted himself up with pride, thinking that everything that was done was because of how great he was. God brought Nebuchadnezzar down really low. If you remember, he gave him the heart of an animal. He says, you think you're so great? Okay, guess what? In an instant, he gave him the heart of a beast until he's outside like a madman chewing grass. It says his hair became like eagle's feathers and his nails grew and became like talons. He, started, he basically was looked like an animal, became like an animal for seven years. This is the great, mighty, powerful king that established this, this awesome dominion. And he's out walking around eating the grass like a cow. That's what God does. And that's what God had to do to Nebuchadnezzar to teach him that the most high ruleth among men. We need to remember that. When you start thinking, oh man, I'm doing all this, I'm doing this, I'm doing that, and I'm so great. Give the credit where it lies. Every good gift and every perfect gift cometh from above, from the Father of lights. Whatever skills you have in this life, give thanks to God for them. And like I said, maybe you are excelling in a very good area of your life. Not riches, not the, you know, not the money, not the other the things that this world considers success. But maybe you start going out, man, you get on fire winning souls. You get on fire serving God. And you do all this stuff. Do not let yourself get lifted up in yourself. The Apostle Paul even said, because, I mean, think about if anyone could get lifted up, the Apostle Paul, look at how much Scripture is, is, came from his hand or from his pen, right? He's the one that gave us all those epistles of Paul in the New Testament and was used mightily of God. And he even said when we went over 1 Corinthians um, last week, how he was used, he labored more abundantly than all the other apostles. He did all his great work. But see, God gave him a thorn in the flesh. He said, God, God gave me a thorn. And we don't know exactly what that is, but some sort of physical ailment to keep himself from getting too lifted up in how much he was being used by God. And you know what? He had the, great, the right attitude, the humble attitude. Hey, praise the Lord. He said, I entreated God. I entreated the Lord three times that he might take this away from me. And he, and he said, God answered him and said, you know, my grace be sufficient for thee. That basically he needed to have that. And it was, a, it was a messenger of Satan to buffet him, lest he would be lifted up with pride because of how much work he was doing for the Lord. And let's just make sure that we don't have to get a messenger of Satan to buffet us in order to get us on the right path and make sure we don't get proud and lifted up and that God has to deal with us in that manner. You're in Proverbs 16. Just flip back uh, to Proverbs 15. Maybe it's on the same page for you or one, one page backwards. Proverbs 15, verse 25. The Bible reads, The Lord will destroy the house of the proud, but he will establish the border of the widow. Again, pride goeth before destruction. God will destroy your house. He will destroy what you have and bring you low. 
If that's, an, if that's an, a problem area that you have in your life. Turn if you want to Habakkuk chapter 2. Habakkuk is in the minor prophets. You go forward from the book of Proverbs. You go past the, the major books of Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Daniel. And you start going into the minor prophets. Find Habakkuk. And we're going to look at Habakkuk chapter 2. We're going to see another aspect here. If you want to avoid being a prideful person... If you want to make sure that you don't fall into this trap and you don't get the destruction that comes with, um, with being a proud person, then you're going to need to make sure that you're avoiding alcohol consumption. Because drinking alcohol raises the level of your, of your prideness, of, of how proud you are. We're going to start reading in verse number 4, Habakkuk chapter number 2. Habakkuk 2 chapter 4, the Bible reads, Behold, his soul which is lifted up is not upright in him, but the just shall live by his faith. Yea, also because he transgresseth by wine, he is a proud man, neither keepeth at home, who enlargeth his desire as hell, and is as death and cannot be satisfied, but gathereth unto him all nations and heapeth unto him all people. So we see there in verse number five, it says that, or in verse number four, behold, his soul which is lifted up is not upright. So the person who's proud, they're not walking uprightly. They're not walking the way they should be. It says, but the just, those that do, are upright. It says, they'll live by faith. And verse number five says, yea, also, in addition to this, because he transgresseth by wine, because he's a drunkard, because he's drinking wine and getting drunk, he is a proud man. That's the reason. Now, I've known a lot of people that they could be pretty meek and humble when they're sober, but they start drinking and watch out. They get that spirit in them. And now all of a sudden they've got more boldness. They've got false boldness because they're drinking these spirits. That's why they're called spirits. You go to the store where you say wine and spirits or, or beer and spirits. Because you're getting another spirit. It's not the spirit of God. It's a spirit from Satan when you drink wine, when you drink that alcohol. But when these people will drink, all of a sudden... They'll start to become more bold and they'll get more proud, right? A lot of people will, it'll cause them to get into fights and to do things that they wouldn't normally do. But when they transgress by wine, they're a proud man. And then jump down to verse number 15. This is going to segue into my next section on pride. Verse 15 of Habakkuk 2. Now, this is a verse you're going to want to highlight in your Bible. Because this demonstrates a, a truth here that I think is very important that we all need to see and we need to hear. Verse number 15, Woe unto him that giveth his neighbor drink, that puttest thy bottle to him and makest him drunken also, that thou mayest look on their nakedness. So for earlier in the chapter, we saw the person transgressing by wine and being a proud man. And then in verse 15, look what it says. Woe unto him that giveth his neighbor drink. And look at the pronouns that are used here. His neighbor, there's a man who has a neighbor that puttest thy bottle, thy, to him. So the man neighbor giving another man neighbor drink and makest him drunken also. So this proud drunk man giving his neighbor drink that thou mayest look on their nakedness. It's the proud, drunk man trying to get alcohol to another man to look on their nakedness. Watch out for that, folks. Watch out for the proud sodomite that's trying to get people drunk because that's one of the ways that they, that they are able to um, attack their victims is by getting them inebriated and getting them to a position to where they can't do anything about it and they're just setting a trap for people. Another reason just to avoid alcohol altogether because of the people that lay traps with the alcohol. But Habakkuk 2.15 talks about men giving, man giving his neighbor, which is another man, a, a drink to try to look on their nakedness.
turn to Malachi, just a few more pages to the right, Malachi chapter 3. It's the last book of the Old Testament, Malachi chapter number 3. And we're going to look at verse number 14. Malachi 3.14 says, Ye have said, It is vain to serve God. And what profit is it that we have kept His ordinance, and that we have walked mournfully before the Lord of hosts? And look at this. Look at verse 15. And now we call the proud happy. Yea, they that work wickedness are set up. Yea, they that tempt God are even delivered. Is this not a scripture that applies to today's society perfectly? It says, now we call the proud happy. What's another word for happy? Gay. Gay is a word that means happy. These days it doesn't. But now we're, we're talking about people who are happy or who are proud is gay. And what do the, what do the gays do? They have a gay pride parade. Right? The sodomites, the homos, they have their gay pride parade and the world calls them gay. Oh, they're just gay. No, they're not gay. They're a sodomite. They're a homosexual. They're a reprobate. They're an abomination. But we, the world, call the proud happy. Yea, they that work wickedness are set up. They're exalted. Oh, you're supposed to love them. Oh, we're supposed to protect them. No. Not at all. They that work wickedness need to be judged. Turn, if you would, to Romans chapter 1. Just a few more pages. Keep on going. Past the four Gospels. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Acts and Romans. Romans chapter number 1. We're going to see the proud attribute of the homos. We saw that in Malachi 3, verse 15. We call the proud happy, and they that work wickedness are set up. But here is the the biblical verse that, that proves that the sodomite is proud all, without already just knowing that out of, out of daily life and what you see um, in, in the world out there. Look at, we're going to look real quickly here at verse number 24. It says, Wherefore God also gave them up to uncleanness through the lust of their own hearts to dishonor their own bodies between themselves, who changed the truth of God into a lie and worshiped and served the creature more than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. For this cause God gave them up unto vile affections, for even their women did change the natural use into that which is against nature. And likewise also the men, leaving the natural use of the woman, burned in their lust one toward another, men with men working that which is unseemly and receiving in themselves that recompense of their error which was meat. So this is talking about God giving up on the men and women to dishonor their bodies between themselves and to do those things which are not convenient, to, to defile their bodies, to commit these acts of homosexuality between themselves because God has given them up and he's given them over to a reprobate mind, which we see here in verse 28. And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge... God gave them over to a reprobate mind to do those things which are not convenient. God gave them over to that reprobate mind, that rejected mind, to do those things which are not convenient. He's given up on them. And then it continues here in verse 29, giving the attributes, the further attributes of the reprobate, of the sodomite. It's a continuation that the sentence didn't even end from verse 28. Just like they didn't like to keep God in their knowledge, God didn't keep them in his knowledge and he gave them over to reprobate mind to do those things which are not convenient. Verse 29 describes them being filled with all unrighteousness, fornication, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, debate, deceit, malignity, whisperers, backbiters, haters of God, despiteful. These are all the attributes that go along with the reprobate. And then it says proud. Boasters, right? You're boasting because you're proud. You're bragging. They're proud. Inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents, and on and on. We see there the proud attribute of the reprobate. Turn, if you would, to keep a finger here in Romans. We're going to come back to Romans 1. 
Turn back, if you would, to Ezekiel chapter 16. Ezekiel chapter number 16. Now, we know that God hates pride. He hates the proud look. When we see the sins and, and, and what is associated with the sodomite, we should be completely on the other side of that. Anything that has to do with something so repulsive and disgusting as sodomy, we ought to have, make sure that we aren't even anywhere in the ballpark of being closely related to people like that. So if you have pride in your life, you need to get rid of it now because you know who's proud? The sodomite. But just to further illustrate, in Ezekiel chapter 16, to further illustrate the, the, the pride problem that the homo has, we're going to see that laid out in Ezekiel chapter 16. Now, this is a, ch a passage that people will turn to to try to say, oh, yeah, see, God wasn't that mad about their homosexuality when he rained fire and brimstone on the city. It was actually just their pride that he was mad at, and that's false. So we're going to see that here. Look at Ezekiel 16, verse number 48. The Bible reads, As I live, saith the Lord God, Sodom thy sister hath not done, she nor her daughters, as thou hast done, thou and thy daughters. And see, they'll look at this and say, see, and they build this straw man argument of, you say homosexuality is just the worst thing in the world. And no, I don't say that. But I do say that it's worthy of death, and I do think that we should have laws against it. I think it's a really wicked sin. Did I say it was the absolute worst thing in the entire world? No. Because I didn't say that. But it is extremely wicked, and it was bad enough for God to rain fire and brimstone down. But look at what it says. Let's keep reading here because we'll see this passage because people will try to bring this up to soften sodomy and say, oh, it's really not that bad. Verse 49, Behold, this was the iniquity of thy sister Sodom, pride, fullness of bread, and abundance of idleness was in her and in her daughters. Neither did she strengthen the hand of the poor and needy. So it starts off, you know, the root of their problem came down to their pride. You know, the Bible says that the love of money is the root of all evil. And they were proud in their own, in the works of their own hands. They had fullness of bread, right? Which means they were wealthy. They, they, had, they had strove for earning that money and satisfying their flesh and abundance of idleness. They had a bunch of free time. They were so rich, they had so much pride, and they became so idle. They didn't say, I mean, what are they going to do with themselves? They just turned to wickedness. They had nothing to do because they were proud. They didn't turn to God. Well, what else can we do? And they start, you know, reject God and dishonor their bodies between themselves and do abominable things because they're just bored and they've got a ton of money and they have nothing else to do but just get really wicked. Verse number 50. And they were haughty. And there's a word again. It says that they were proud. They were haughty. It's exactly what we see today in the Sodomites. They were haughty and committed abomination before me. Therefore, I took them away as I saw good. He didn't just take them away for their haughtiness. It was because they were haughty and committed abomination. Their pride mixed with their abominable acts, which was their sodomy, which was their homosexuality. God took them away as he saw fit. And the way that he saw fit was raining fire and brimstone, a horrible way to die, being burned up and then them being going straight to hell and continuing their burning forever. God saw that fit. That's the right thing to be done there. They were lifted up with pride and committed abominable acts, so he rained fire and brimstone upon them. But we see the pride there in verse 51. Neither hath Samaria committed half of thy sins, but thou hast multiplied thine abominations more than they, and hast justified thy sisters in all thine abominations which thou hast done. So he's rebuking Israel. He's rebuking them and saying, look, Sodom and, and Samaria, look, they haven't done what you have done. They haven't done anything, you know, like, like he's just trying to say, look how wicked they are. And they did all this wickedness and I saw fit to, to rain fire and bridge on them. And he said, like, and you're even worse. That's pretty bad when you're being compared to Sodom and being told that you're worse. Because this is, that is a pretty bad example. 
The only remedy for that was to destroy him. But what were they? They were proud. They were haughty. They were lifted up. This should show you how God feels about pride more than just reading God hates pride. Let that settle into your heart and hopefully help you from becoming even remotely close to, to having a really proud attitude and try to keep yourself humble so that you're not anywhere even loosely connected with, with that type of extreme wickedness. So flip back if you went to Romans chapter 1. I said we'd be going back here. Another example, people who are really proud besides the sodomites are the atheists and the scientists. And I alluded to this a little bit earlier. I mentioned I brought them up before. You know, and I say scientists in quotes. Okay. Because they don't rely on re these, these God-rejecting people that claim they believe in science and that's why they don't believe in God. They're fools. The fool said in his heart there is no God. They are fools they're foolish. They don't know. Um, they don't believe in. So they believe in a religion called science, but they don't believe in true science, because no true science disproves anything that the Bible says at all. No true science can do that. But these scientists that think that they know so much and they they get so much pride in all the letters and the doctorates and everything after their name and why oh you need to listen to me because of all my education and people get proud in their knowledge the bible says knowledge puffeth up but charity edifieth people get very proud in what they think that they know romans chapter one i believe this is also referring to many of these so-called scientists like the bill nye the science guy and all these other um just science fiction believers. Verse 21 of Romans 1 says, Because that when they knew God, they glorified Him not as God, neither were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations, and their foolish heart was darkened. Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. See, there's a lot of people out there that profess themselves to be wise. And they're real proud. They think they know it all. And they're saying, I'm so smart. And they know nothing at all. Because if you don't believe in God, if you start worshiping and serving the creature more than the creator, whether that be an animal or whether it be man, because a lot of these people just basically worship man. They think that, that man is the ultimate thing and that you essentially are your own God and that, that our minds and our evolution and, you know, makes us the best and, and that man is what they worship. And they are fools. Their foolish heart is darkened because they reject God and they think that they profess themselves. They want you to think that they're wise, but they're really just fools. They're a fool in a wise man's clothing, right? They try to make themselves look smart. So they, they'll put on the, the doctor robe and the stethoscope and, and whatever else they think that they could, whatever costume they want to put on. And you know, it's always so funny. I see news clips every once in a while where like maybe they'll reference some scientist or something and it's, they're always like, in some kind of lab gear like they, they want to build the credibility like oh you're supposed to you're a scientist you're supposed to look like this and then people will will take you more seriously or will, will believe you more it's like why why can't they just wear normal clothes or, or nice clothes or whatever and it's and it's all just a, a charade for many of them i'm going to say all of them but um you know these people that that profess themselves to be wise, wise they're really just fools now uh um, Flip back, if you would, to Proverbs 28. Or actually, you know what? No, go to Jeremiah 43. I'll just read. Go to Jeremiah 43. I'll read for you from Proverbs 28. Because pride will also cause a lot of fights. It'll cause people to, you know, the people who just think that they're right and they're so lifted up in themselves. They have pride. You know, a lot of times, the, the knowledge that puffs up, it's a charity that edifies Charity is caring about other people to where you're not just going to get in fights with them. You're actually going to try to, you know, teach them. Maybe if you are right, you're going to try to teach them lovingly, but it's not, you're not going to be starting a fight over it. Whereas people who get real proud and lifted up in themselves and think that they're so smart, they do go out and they'll start fights and they want to debate, right? They're full of debate, like Romans 1 says. But Proverbs 28, 25 says, He that is of a proud heart stirreth up strife. But he that putteth his trust in the Lord shall be made fat. So the, the person who's proud in their heart, 
They're, they're just stirring up fights, stirring up strife, trying to get in, in all these debates and all these fights. Be why? Because they're proud. Because they think that they're so special and they're so good and they're all right and no one else knows what they're talking about. But look at Jeremiah 43, verse 1. The proud people also call the men of God liars, just like many of those so-called scientists do. Look at Jeremiah 43, verse number 1. And it came to pass that when Jeremiah had made an end of speaking unto all the people, all the words of the Lord their God, for which the Lord their God had sent him to them, even all these words, then spake Azariah the son of Hoshiah and Johanan the son of Korea, and all the proud men, take note of that, saying unto Jeremiah, Thou speakest falsely. The Lord our God hath not sent thee to say, Go not into Egypt to sojourn there. Now Jeremiah was a prophet of the Lord. And they went to him asking, Hey, what should we do? And he says, Well, don't go into Egypt. I asked God. He said, This is what you need to do. This, thus saith the Lord. This is the word of the Lord. And then the proud men that think that they know better and they want to do things their own way and they don't want to have anything to do with God. They don't want to listen to God. They're the first ones to call the prophet a liar. Oh, that's not, that's not what God said. You're just lying. Oh, God doesn't say that, that uh, you know, homosexuals should be put to death. You're lying. You check your pride because God did say that. Don't be one of the proud men that attacks and just calls, just shouts liar to people who are preaching God's word, to people who are men of God, like Jeremiah was. Turn if you would to 1 Timothy chapter 6, New Testament, 1 Timothy chapter 6. see some examples of pro proud people. We see that alcohol brings pride out in people. We saw that the sodomites are full of pride. We see that, you know, people who profess themselves to be wise are very proud, these, these so-called scientists and atheists. But there's also religions out there that are very proud and lifted up and think that they're better than everybody else. There's one specifically out here that called the Potter's House, the people who teach the works-based salvation that if you backslide, you're going to hell, but if you just live a righteous life and do everything that's right, then you're going to go to heaven, which is wicked as hell. Those are some of the most proud people I've ever met in my life out soul winning that go to that church in town here. And what it is, is it's just a, it, I mean, it's just a, a, a false church that believes that you could lose your salvation. And they preach hardcore on the works. When you go out trying to soul win with them, it's always a fight. It's always a strife. They're always trying to stir up strife because they're proud. You know, we bring the gospel humbly to them, trying to show them what the Bible says, and they're always just looking to start a fight. At least the ones that are, that are really plugged in. You know, sometimes you run into people who aren't really that that into the church, but the ones that are really plugged into it, it's always a fight. 1 Timothy chapter 6, look at verse number 3. Bible reads, If any man teach otherwise and consent not to wholesome words, even the words of our Lord Jesus Christ and to the doctrine which is according to godliness. And these are men that do just that. They teach otherwise. We go to them bringing the wholesome words, the words of our Lord Jesus Christ, like, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. The doctrine which is according to godliness, they teach otherwise because they say, no, you got to work. Verse 4, he is proud. The people who teach otherwise, they're proud. Knowing nothing but doting about questions and strifes of words, whereof cometh envy, strife, railings, evil surmisings, perverse disputings of men of corrupt minds. It's all, all these words are just talking about these fights that they have and these questions and, and striving with people. Railings, getting railing accusations against you. Perverse disputings, disputings again is more fightings of men of corrupt minds and destitute of the truth. They don't know the truth at all. They're destitute of it. It's taken away from them. They have no knowledge of the truth. Supposing that gain is godliness. 
thinking that they're so godly because of their financial gain because of whatever it is that they have. Well, God's really blessed me. I must be, I must be acting very godly because I have all of this money. That's the attitude. That's the prosperity preaching, by the way. From such, withdraw thyself. Stay away from those people. It's not worth your efforts. You don't need to go out and get in fights with those people. Withdraw yourself from them because they don't know anything. They just want to dispute and argue and fight with you and waste your time so that the next door, the person next door doesn't get saved. There's a lot of religions that are proud. The holy rollers. The people that think that they're, that they're holier than thou. Right? You hear that a lot and it turns off a lot of people and rightfully so. The, the extremely judgmental. And, these, and it's always the people that are relying in their works. They think that they're so good. Which is why Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9 say, For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Because God already knew that, that if he made it based on our works, what are people going to do? They're going to be bragging about it and saying how good I am and how bad you are. Like the man at the potter's house who kept on trying to ask me, well, what's the difference between you and a sinner? And I wouldn't play his game. I said, I am a sinner. What's the difference between you and a sinner? I am a sinner. And he was getting angry. He was like a broken record. He did, I just would not say, oh, well, I'm righteous. Like he expected me to say how holy and great I am because that's what they believe. And I said, look, I am a sinner. I don't deserve heaven. And I know you think that you do, but you don't. You think that your good works and you're following Christ so closely. It's going to send you to hell, my friend, because you're proud. Because you're boasting, because you think that your good works are what save you and you have not humbled yourself and received the free gift of salvation. Amen. The Bible says in Proverbs 13, verse 10, only by pride cometh contention, but with the well-advised is wisdom. The contention and the fighting comes from pride. You have a lot of fighting and problems in your marriage and just, just constant fighting. Check the pride. Check the pride level. Are you too proud to admit you're wrong ever? Are you just, you just cannot swallow that pride and just say, humble yourself to say, I'm sorry I was wrong? Pride is a source of contention, fighting. Everybody needs to check their pride. Even the husband who is in charge. Hey, pride is a sin for you as well, husband. Just as it would be for the wife. Pride is, is, it crosses genders. Make sure that you're not proud. Check that pride. Pride brings contention. You can be a leader. You could be in charge and not be proud. Who thinks Jesus Christ was a good leader? I, I think he was a great leader. I think he led his disciples. I think he led a lot of people. I think he's leading people to heaven every day. I think you can't find a better leader, but you know what? Jesus Christ was not proud at all. He did his job exactly the way he was supposed to do. Turn forward to 2 Chronicles chapter number 32. We're going to look at a story with Hezekiah. But before we get there, I'm going to read a few uh, passages for you. James 4 verse 6 reads, But he giveth more grace. Wherefore he saith, God resisteth the proud, but giveth grace unto the humble. Submit yourselves therefore to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Again, we see, if you want God fighting against you, Get proud. If you want destruction, get proud. Just have pride. But if you can submit yourselves to God, submitting yourself means you're humbling yourself. It means you're swallowing pride. Whatever it is that you think that, that I'm not going to sink to that level or whatever because I'm better than that. Hey, submit yourself. Submit yourself to God and His authority so that God isn't just resisting you. 
It's easy to see through the eyes of a parent. We need to remember that analogy that we're, we're, we're children of God. God will resist you when you're proud and you don't want to listen to them and you think you're better or whatever. I, th this truth is apparent to me all the time with children. When I can see their pride, when I'm telling them to do something and they don't want to do it and, and they think that, that there's, you know, I shouldn't do that because I'm old enough now to not have to do those things or wh whatever the case may be, whatever, wherever the source of their pride is. And I'll tell you what, I resist that. I'll resist that to the day I die. And I think that, that we see here that God has that same attribute of resisting that pride in his children. Psalm 138 verse 6 reads, Though the Lord be high, yet hath he respect unto the lowly, but the proud he knoweth afar off. See, pride is when you're lifting yourself up. And what this is saying is that God is lifted up. He is high. He is exalted more than anything or anyone. God is at the peak. He's at the height. But even though he's way up there and we're way down here, it says, he hath respect unto the lowly. When you're humble, when you are not lifting yourself up with pride, he has respect unto that. He appreciates that. He says, yeah, the respect on the Lord, but the proud he knoweth afar off. Oh, yeah, you're proud? Yeah, yeah, get away from me. I know you, you're, but you're, you're way far off from me. But I'll have respect on he'll, he'll, he'll come down to the lowly and be right there with him. But the proud that are trying to lift themselves up by God, yeah, they're going to be, they're going to be afar off. Second Chronicles 32 is where I had you turn. We're going to look at Hezekiah. We're going to see an example here. We're almost done. We're going to see this last example. And I got one more point. Hezekiah was one of the kings of Judah. He was a righteous king. He was a godly man. He was a saved man. But he had a problem with, with pride and, and he, he suffered a consequence for it. Again, pride isn't just about the unbelievers. Or the, you know, the wicked unbelievers that are going to hell. It's for the Christian too. We need to make sure that this is not a part of our life. 2 Chronicles 32 verse 24 reads, In those days Hezekiah was sick to the death and prayed unto the Lord and he spake unto him and he gave him a sign. But Hezekiah rendered not again according to the benefit done unto him. For his heart was lifted up. Therefore there was wrath upon him and upon Judah and Jerusalem. So basically what happened was is that Hezekiah was told he was going to die. And he, and he humbled himself and he prayed to God and he begged God, God, you know, basically, look at all the good I've done with my life. God, please give me more time. Please add unto my ears. And God said, okay. He listened to, to Hezekiah. He gave him a sign and said, I'm going to add 15 more years to your life because you asked for it. And he did that. But after that, his heart was lifted up and that brought wrath on him from God. And, and upon Judah and Jerusalem. So not just him. There's a whole bunch of other people suffered as a result of Hezekiah's pride. In verse 26 says, Notwithstanding, so even though this happened, Hezekiah humbled himself for the pride of his heart. Both he and the inhabitants of Jerusalem so that the wrath of the Lord came not upon them in the days of Hezekiah. So God's wrath still ends up coming, but when he humbles himself, he says, okay, well, it's not going to come for a little while. You know, I, I'll wait until after you die, but the judgment is still going to come. Look at 2 Kings chapter 20. We're going to see now, this is the 2 Chronicles 32. We're looking at the, like kind of the summary of, of this stuff that happened. And in 2 Kings chapter 20, now we're going to see the pride that Hezekiah had. And the reason why I'm turning is because I want you to see what God is considering to be pride. Because I think oftentimes people will justify their sin and not recognize it for what it really is. Oh, I'm not pride. I'm just doing this. It's always, I'm, oh, I'm not doing, I don't have idols. I'm just... Looking at that, you know, whatever, whatever it is, it's always the, oh, I'm just doing this and excusing it somehow and calling the sin just by a different name, which isn't a sin. You say, oh, yeah, that's, that's not a sin. I'm, I'm, I'm only doing whatever. 
I think you'll get what I'm talking about when we read this passage here. 2 Kings chapter 20. Look at verse number 12, which is where I start reading. At that time, Baradak Baladan, the son of Baladan, king of Babylon, sent letters and a present unto Hezekiah, for he had heard that Hezekiah had been sick. So basically the story I already said, Hezekiah was sick, he was sick unto death, prayed unto God, God healed him, gave him this great sign, and this king of Babylon then sent unto Hezekiah, because, yeah, I heard you were sick, right? And verse 13 says, And Hezekiah hearkened unto them and showed them all the house of his precious things, the silver and the gold and the spices and the precious ointment and all the house of his armor and all that was found in his treasures. There was nothing in his house nor in all his dominion that Hezekiah showed them not. So these messengers came just trying to say, hey, you know, we're glad that you're doing well, right, from another king. And then when they came in, they asked to see whatever. And Hezekiah opened up all, all of his wealth, everything in the kingdom. He showed it all to them. Now, from this story, and then it says in verse 14, Then came Isaiah the prophet unto King Hezekiah and said unto him, What said these men, and from whence came they unto thee? And Hezekiah said, They are come from a far country, even from Babylon. And he said, What have they seen in thine house? And Hezekiah answered, all the things that are in mine house have they seen. There is nothing among my treasures that I have not showed them. When you just read this story, it, it can be very easy to skip over the pride. Right? You say, well, oh, he just showed them everything. He just showed them his stuff. Where's the pride? I mean, 2 Chronicles chapter 32 said that he was proud. I don't see the pride here. The pride is in the fact that he's showing them all of his goods. That lifts himself up saying, well, look how good I am. I've got this and I've got this and I've got that and I've got that. And look at all these treasures and look at all this stuff that I have. That's boasting, my friends. That's being proud. Amen. And you could say, oh, but he was just trying to show them all these things. Well, why? Why was he trying to show them that stuff? He was lifting himself up as a king. Say, you know, these guests came from a far country. Oh, you haven't heard about us? Oh, well, well, look at how cool we are. Look at all the stuff that we have. Look at all the treasures that we have. That is pride. And saying, God healed him. He humbled himself and begged God for mercy. God healed him. And then what does he do? Look how great I am, right? And it's like, it's like the people who... They find God all of a sudden after their life, you know, or, or they, get, they catch themselves in a moment, right? A moment of panic, in a moment of despair, a moment of trouble. Maybe they're, they're, they're driving out in their car. They don't have to be that old. They're driving out in their car. They've been an atheist. They don't care about God. All of a sudden, man, they see they're just going to get in this horrible wreck and they're probably going to die. They get scared fast. All of a sudden, they're praying to God and doing everything. God, just get me through this. Oh, wait, oh, whatever I need. God, just help me get through this. And then maybe they get delivered and they get through that. And what Hezekiah did, it would be like them just then going back to, oh, yeah, you know, blowing it off and being proud again. See, they were brought real low in their time of trouble. Hezekiah was brought real low in his time of, I'm going to die. This is real. And then right after he's healed, what does he do? Goes right back to being proud again. And God hates that. God hated the fact that he showed all of his stuff unto people. Now think about that. Are you the type of person that when you invite people over, you say, look at this and look at this and look at how great my house is and look at all my cars and look at all my things and look at all my stuff. You're bragging. You're being proud. No, but I'm just trying to... No, you're being proud. Don't be a braggart. God hates it. You know what this cost Hezekiah? It made God so mad. Verse 16. And Isaiah said unto Hezekiah, Hear the word of the Lord. Behold, the days come that all that is in thine house and that which thy fathers have laid up in store unto this day shall be carried into Babylon. Nothing shall be left, saith the Lord. Oh, you thought you're so cool with all of your treasures? 
with all the stuff that has been laid up from generation to generation of, of the kings before you that have amassed this wealth, and now you're just going to show it off to everyone? Well, guess what? Now they're going to come and take it all. And you're going to be left with nothing. Because you think that you're so, you know, you're so proud and lifted up because you have all this stuff, I could take it away in a heartbeat. And God could take away your stuff and your house and your fancy cars and fancy clothing or whatever it is that you want to show off to other people, God could take it away in a heartbeat. Amen. Don't be proud. Humble yourself. Last place we're going to turn. Look at Luke 18. Luke 18. Last section. Last point. Pride is a wicked, wicked sin. God hates it. And pride will actually prevent people from getting saved. Pride is one of the things that that will be a stumbling block unto people to believing on the Lord Jesus Christ. Look at Pro, or Luke 18. I was just speaking this morning to a man that was, was talking about his father. And, and all the things that he was saying, I was just like, he's, a, he's proud, isn't he? He's got pride. I mean, it just, it's all the attributes of, a, of someone who's prideful. And he brought up the contentions, the fighting. He said he's not happy. Yeah, you're not going to have peace when you're always fighting with people. You're not going to have the joy when you don't have the peace because you're always fighting with people. He thinks he's right. No one could ever knock him off his pedal. Yeah, he's proud. He's proud and he knows nothing. And unfortunately, hopefully not, but unfortunately in that case, he, it'll probably send him to hell. Look at Luke 18, verse number 9. And he spake this parable unto certain which trusted in themselves that they were righteous and despised others. So Jesus is going to give them a lesson here. Because most people think that they're going to heaven because they're so good and they're so righteous and they're trusting in themselves. When you're trusting in a works-based salvation, I don't care if you want to add Christ or leave Christ out of it, you're a proud person and you're trusting in yourselves. And this is a parable for you, what Jesus, what Jesus taught here. Verse 10, two men went up into the temple to pray. The one a Pharisee and the other a publican. Pharisee, right? The priest. This guy, he's all lifted up. And, and he's the spiritual one. He's the one that people look to. Oh, wow, what a man of God. Right? Because he's doing it for show. The Pharisee and then just some publican. They both go into the temple to pray. Verse 11, the Pharisee stood and prayed thus with himself. Right? Praying with myself. He's making sure that, that he's saying all these words for himself, with himself. God, I thank thee that I am not as other men are, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even as this publican. Right? I mean, there's a guy that just came in to pray. He's saying, God, thank you. Thank you that I'm not just, you didn't make me one of these wicked people that I'm so great that I do all these great things for you, that I'm not even like this guy over here, lifting himself up above everybody else. I fast twice in the week. <laughs> Most people never fast. I fast twice a week. I give tithes of all that I possess. That's the Pharisee speaking. Verse 13, And the publican, standing afar off, didn't even... Have the, didn't even want to come all the way up to the altar or whatever, would not lift up so much as his eyes unto heaven, but smote upon his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. He recognizes his sin. He recognizes his wickedness. He can't even lift up his eyes to heaven. He's, I'm just going to keep my head down because I'm lowly, because I'm a sinner, and I need mercy. That is not the attitude that the Pharisee had. He wasn't looking for mercy from God. He's just going, hey, God, thanks. I'm not a sinner. I'm not wicked. And he was a sinner. He's proud and he knows nothing. Verse 14, I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. Talking about the publican being justified and not 
the Pharisee, for everyone that exalteth himself shall be abased, and he that humbleth himself shall be exalted. God will lift you. humble yourself, God will lift you up. You don't need to worry about lifting yourself up. Not at all. Don't consider it for a second. You say, yeah, but I want to be lifted up to such a great position. Okay. Humble yourself. Bring yourself low. Let God do the, the lifting up for you. Verse 15, And they brought unto him also infants, that he would touch them. But when his disciples saw it, they rebuked them. But Jesus called them unto him and said, Suffer little children to come unto me, and forbid them not. For of such is the kingdom of God. Verily I say unto you, Whosoever shall not receive the kingdom of God as a little child shall in no wise enter therein. He says, you, in order to be saved, you have to enter the, the kingdom of God like a little child. Why? A little child is humble. A little child knows they can't do everything on their own. Sometimes I'll joke around with the kids when they, when they want something and they come to us and ask us for, for whatever, you know, ask us for, for food or something. I could say, well, just go, go in the car and go get it yourself. Oh, I can't do that. You know, and they know they can't do that. They know they can't do things. So they come to us and ask us for things. The proud person doesn't want to ask anyone for anything. They don't want the free gift from God because they want to earn it themselves. They want to do the work. They want to go through all the trouble to say, I've earned this and I deserve this, but they don't deserve it. And they can't earn it because they've already screwed up and they don't even realize it. They need to humble themselves and accept the free gift like a little child. Just ask for it. So God, I can't do this on my own. There's no way I can work hard enough to get this gift. Please give it to me, Lord. I'm just a sinner. Please save me. Pride's a serious sin. Serious for the unbeliever as well as the believer. Pride sends people to hell. We need to lose the pride in our lives and stay far away from it. If you don't want God resisting you, if you want God on your side, you better make sure you're a humble person. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for these great words of wisdom. Lord, we love you and we want to serve you, dear God, and we don't want our pride getting in the way. Lord, help us, especially when we're out sowing and we're trying to do your work, that we wouldn't let our pride get in the way, but that we could humbly, meekly be able to instruct people, dear Lord, and know that, that when they oppose us, they're really just opposing themselves and that we wouldn't... Um, get our pride in the way and get caught up in contentions and strives, dear Lord, with them, but that we can just humbly just not be around them and leave, dear Lord, and move on to the next person who's willing to listen and not want to just get into fights and debates, dear Lord. I pray that you please help us in our personal relationships and our lives to be able to make sure that we're humble enough to admit when we do wrong, where we're humble enough to be able to move past things, dear Lord, and not to be bitter and not to... Um, hold on and, and just because of our own silly pride not um, you know cause more fightings and problems dear Lord we love you we thank you for this great instruction that you've given us dear Lord and it's in Jesus name we pray Amen